So um, by way of a bit of a preface, this is very much still a work in progress, although I have been working on it for about four years. Uh, so since September 2015, in fact, when my colleague and collaborator, Purdy Phillips over there, and I met up with Dr. William Humphreys in the Central Library Cafe in Perth, Western Australia. Purdy and I were exploring some new collaborations, and Bill, we found out, was the foremost expert in Australia and possibly the world on stygofauna. And he happened to live in Perth. So Purdy, Bill, and I chatted for almost two hours. Bill was generous with his time and his enthusiasm for this weird duo of writer and artist who wanted to pick his brain about stygofauna. Two years later, we brought Bill to Sydney and then by train to Lithgow on a field trip that we organized. Uh, 30 of us did this train shop slash walk shop to Lithgow and its local mining museum under the theme of going underground. As our invitation to our participants went, with extraction a hot button issue for Australian publics, this art science walk shop and field trip aims to go underground. That is to engage a transdisciplinary exploration of matters of concern related to the th vertical third dimension. That is gas and mineral mining, subterranean ecologies, as well as the politics, economics, and cultures of extraction and life underground. What relations are still to be forged between the rocks, waters, and species, human and non-human, that all have different stakes in these questions? What kinds of knowledge making and relational practices can enhance the parameters of our research and our actions? Bill was one of our experts whom we mic'd up with my sort of fancy aerobics instructor microphone um, on the train and he told us more about stygofauna, species that he memorably describes as, quote, blind white cockroaches that live underground and get in the way of mines. I think it was a pretty amazing trip. Some of you in the room were there. Um, we were artists, writers, scientists, environmental activists, hanging out with miners and former miners talking about what's underground. And I'm going to show some photographic documentation from that day during the talk. But I say all of this um, by way of preface, not only to introduce Purdy and Bill and acknowledge their very pivotal contributions to this talk and my thinking about stygofauna more generally, but also because that walk shop has been really helpful for me trying to figure out what multi-species justice might mean when faced with endangered species that we don't see, that we don't live with, you know, explicitly, whose life worlds open to us literally through the borehole of extraction. In other words, when multi-species justice is tangled up and tethered to both estrangement and complicity. So as you'll hear, I haven't quite figured out what multi-species justice might mean in this context, although I will offer a few speculative suggestions. But I am sure that the rather experimental methods that I've been working with in the past few years, so walking with, thinking with, drawing with, sitting with, talking with, being tense with, singing with, laughing with, being exhausted with, composing with, storying with. These methods are all crucial for thinking about what being with in ethical terms might mean. Well, I don't say much more about these methods in the talk itself. I hope its constituent parts, so this preface, the images you'll see, the short cli-fi story that I'm going to begin with, and the talk itself will give you a feel for what these methods might entail. And I'd be happy to talk about it more in question time. So the rest of the talk's about 20 minutes and it's composed of four parts. And hopefully my timing of slides is going to work exquisitely now. Part one, refugium before. Our flight was precipitated by a changing geological choreography. The breakup of Pangea and Gondwana, the drift north of a progressively thirsty world, the rise of the Antipodes from the belly of the sea. So really, we came to be what you would now call climate refugees, 
Where there had been rainforests and water in abundance, the dry soon arrived. We went underground seeking refuge in the cool and in the dark. The climate there was pleasing. Without sunlight, the temperature remained steady for days, months, years. We didn't mark the seasons by the light or the heat or the angle of the sun, but by flow through the pores of our mineralized homes. Seasons were turned on and off by rainfall and ri river flow, or more recently, by temporal patterns of irrigation. We've become accustomed to these thermal comforts and cycles of wet. We've even thrived. Like other refugees, we learn to live the geometries of separation. When our surface home cleaved in two and the Tethys Sea flooded the void, some of us took up residence in the Ancheoline system strung out along the vast Tethian coastlines. In these refugia, we were polished by the ebb and flow of underground tides and tied to our kin across space by the pull of a moon we would never see. We had also learned to live without eyes after all. When Gondwana broke apart, some of us stayed here while other kin drifted. And so alongside the development of non-optic sense organs, we learned to love at a distance traces of these kinships still legible in the texts of our flesh. We have become maps of evolutions written on our mostly spineless forms in a silent subterranean grail. We also learned to do difference well. We responded to these partings with a fine scale endemism and learned the tricks of internal speciation. We are now in place in radically local ways. Like the ancient seas, our existence receded. We would become literally your shadow bodies in your shadow places. And this is how it would be for years and decades and millennia before the weather underground. Part two, stygofauna. Stygofauna are tiny animals, mostly invertebrates, that live in subterranean waters. They comprise crustaceans, but also include beetles, snails, mites, and worms. They've evolved to exist without sunlight, in constant temperatures, and are dependent on infiltration of nutrients from the surface world. Because of this, stygofauna are most abundant in shallow aquifers where food supply and oxygen are generally more plentiful. Ironically, Australia's aquifers were until very recently thought to be a biological desert. Yet the diversity of this continent's stygofaunal populations is in fact remarkable, among the richest in the world, with known taxa numbering in the thousands. The biodiversity of Australian stygofauna is related to their narrow endemism. Like other stygofauna around the world, these Antipodean groundwater denizens are adapted to a near steady state environment. They have very limited spatial disruptions. In Australia, this is compounded by the continent's geological record. Quite simply, these groundwaters are very, very, very old. The resulting radical localism informs part of stygofauna's environmental value. Many species would fulfill IUCN criteria for being vulnerable or endangered due to their aerial extent and their very narrow localism alone. Related to this, their deep dwelling in place makes them, quote, important subjects in unraveling deep history. Their groundwater homes have come to be known as living museums, and their tiny bodies relics, offering clues to deep time worlds. This temporal spatial idiosyncrasy and isolated genetic diversity bestows on them additional scientific and conservation significance. And like other shadow bodies, stygofauna are responsible for unnoticed labors that nonetheless maintain the surface world. <coughs> 
In eating bacteria, they keep the groundwater clean. They graze biofilms, modify redox gradients, and alter interstitial pore size in aquifers with their albeit limited movements. They physically transport material through the groundwater environment, and aquifer health depends on these small labors, while surface water health depends on the well-being of subterranean waters. Part three, the weather underground. Most of the literature on stygofauna stresses their resilience, or I'm sorry, stresses their reliance on the even keel of their subterranean climate. Their well-being is particularly susceptible to changes in water quality where groundwater deviates from background conditions. Their capacity to recover from such disturbances is limited by low mobility, low reproductive rates, and dependence on localized and limited food supplies. While some recent studies suggest that the steady state required by stygofauna is overstated, after all, groundwater conditions are in some degree of flux all the time, it's also clear that rapid and excessive incursions into their habitats can be devastating. And what could possibly have the capacity to puncture the surface of the earth and make such a violent intrusion? Massive mineral extraction industries in Australia, and coal mining and coal seam gas developments in particular, pose a clear and present threat to stygofauna well-being. Groundwater extraction, including mine dewatering, significantly alters the sediment matrix necessary for stygofaunal nourishment. Subjected to groundwater drawdown caused by extraction, stygofauna can become stranded or forced to penetrate the earth more deeply where nourishment is in short supply. They are also sensitive to changes in aquifer pressure and pore dimensions due to subsidence. Moreover, the effects of coal seam gas developments leak far beyond the target aquifers to impact contiguous groundwater. In short, under the shadow of modern extraction industries, stygofauna are marooned, starved, and displaced in a polluted and drying underworld. Might we then say, quite plainly, that mining is their anthropogenic climate change, that extraction is their weather maker, that drilling, forcing, injecting, scraping, displacing, and removing is the weather underground? This surmisal might sound metaphorical, poetic even. But as my colleague Jennifer Hamilton and I have argued elsewhere, Weather is pervasive in ways that make distinctions between the meteorological and the social rather leaky, not unlike the much critiqued nature culture divide. While climate change certainly affects us all, its phenomena always cut along gendered, raced, classed, and colonial lines in well documented ways. And we're drawing here, of course, on the work of black studies and feminist scholar Christina Sharp, who suggests that weather is anti blackness. Black bodies must endure what Sharp calls the total climate that is anti-blackness. In addition to anti-blackness that Sharp identifies, Jennifer and I then propose that the total weather of our time includes not only climate change, but also, as always, coloniality, misogyny, and the resourcing and thingification of other bodies, poor, queer, non-human, disabled. Weathering means learning to live with changing conditions of rainfall, drought, heat, thaw, and storm as never separable from the total climate of social, political, and cultural existence. So considered in this way, large-scale extraction is not only a literal weather maker, um, not only in terms of its incursion into the geos and its disturbance of the hydrosphere, not only in terms of its precipitation of carbon emissions and petrocapitalist consumption that generates a massive burden of planetary waste, but also in the social relations it devastates. This kind of weather is certainly heavy in the air around us. Kristen Simmons has described current extractive regimes as producing, quote, settler atmospherics. What she describes as, quote, the normative and necessary violence is found in settlement, accruing, adapting, and constricting indigenous and black life in the settler state. 
Tim Choi and Jerry Z write similarly about what they call the socio-atmospherics of power. Extraction is, of course, a question of environmental justice, and its weaponized weathers target certain populations differently within settler capitalist white supremacies. As Tim Choi reminds us, quote, atmospheres do not equalize. An important point then about these weathers is not only that they are experienced as environmental and sociocultural, but that they are, like climate change in the purely climatological sense, always also anthropogenic. These weathers are of the planet, but they are also made by bodies, systems, and structures that channel power and violence into the air. Given this and the clear connection of extractive industries to human weathers above ground, could we not also imagine the extension of this weather to the realm beneath our feet? And in doing so, we not only acknowledge the environmental incursion that is extraction, but we might also potentially link any stygofaunal ethics to the weather patterns above ground, the lineaments of power, force, and materiality that make up our weather world in the context of extraction. Part four. Knowledge, estrangement, complicity, and contiguity. There is much about stygofauna that we don't know. Despite the recent outpouring of information about their ecological significance, the literature uniformly acknowledges that this data quite literally barely scratches the surface. There is no natural history of stygofauna in Australia, not one written by humans anyway. For these species do not give themselves over to observation, notation, and contact readily. On some estimates, maybe 10% of their taxa in Australia are known to us. How far do their communities extend? How deep? These answers, too, remain mostly guesswork. So another common feature of the reports on stygofauna in Australia is thus the call for more knowledge. Quote, the dearth of knowledge surrounding the diversity, distribution, and ecology of stygofauna in Australia cre creates considerable uncertainty in the assessment of ecological risks associated with coal mining and CSG activities, writes one governmental body. In an era of high anthropogenic extinction rates, biodiversity estimates are considered a vital tool for identifying knowledge gaps for the purpose of developing conservation policies. So we need more information, these reports plead. And certainly, familiarity is one way of making common cause. Tell me about yourself, we say. Let's get to know one another. We might even say, I want our relationship to go deeper. <laughs> but what kind of path into multi-species justice would this be? Well, we could look at what we know, but while we're at it, let's look at where we know and how and why. For as I trawl through all the reports on stygofauna conservation, certain observations stand out. One, knowledge about stygofauna maps pretty much directly onto a geography of coal deposits and coal seams. Two, areas of great stygofaunal diversity, or known diversity, I should say, coincide with coal mining activities. Three, we know most about stygofauna in the Pilbara and Yilgarn regions, those parts of Australia that have been the site of the most intensive mineral industry development. And four, quote, increasingly regulations requiring the inclusion of subterranean fauna during environmental review process for major resource prospects by the Environmental Protection Agency have accelerated the discovery of new species. I also read, quote, research and new knowledge about stygofauna will inform and improve the risk assessments for groundwater ecosystems that are increasingly necessary as part of mining developments. This research will, quote, promote the coal industry as the leader in the sustainable management of aquifers and biodiversity. Well, perhaps it's worth stating this more plainly. Without extractivism, we would know almost nothing about these underground worlds. It is large-scale extraction that allows us to extend our attention to this life below the radish line, 
and find with these bodies some kind of common cause. It is only because of assessments undertaken to facilitate drilling down that we know much about them at all. So what does it mean that a fossil fueled complicity may be the main thread traced by the fractured stony splitting of the coal seam that can actually hold us in common? What does it mean, if knowing each other is our ground for multi-species justice, that extractivism provides its conditions of possibility? King Cole, that tiny translucent body without a backbone, and me, cleave together through the wound of the earth where cleaving is both an attractive pulling together and a violent pulling apart. So again, where does this leave us in terms of multi-species justice? Well, I'm certainly not calling for less knowledge. Our complicity in extraction cannot be responded to with a call for ignorance or for unknowing the world, as in unlearned steigofauna. Those of you at this university will get that joke. Um, of course, we require knowledge of steigofauna lives and life worlds. Even the Adani Carmichael coal mine consultants agree. Indeed, the groundwater dependent ecosystems management plan for the proposed Adani mine, which was given the green light just last week, includes mention of steigofauna a whole 31 times. Monitoring, quote, steigofauna presence and endemicity, it seems, will be a crucial part of ascertaining that the corporation has indeed, quote, minimized the impact of aquifer drawdown. The means proposed for doing so is, quote, steigofauna survey. But we might remember that steigofauna are a queer sort of critter. They have very narrow worldviews, literally. Thriving species that you discover below your feet may be complete no-shows just over the next hill. Aquifers, the places in which stygofauna dwell, are similarly shifty, particularly in terms of those waters that filter through karst systems, layers of shale, and other small pockets in the pants of the geos. We know relatively little about it. We cannot measure or anticipate groundwater with scientific accuracy because it outwits most tools of Western scientific knowledge, how we know to measure time, space, volume, consistency, and depth. Groundwater might allow us estimates about these measures, but it refuses full and final certainty. Given this ontological situation of both groundwater and steigofauna, always one step ahead of or below our quests for certain kinds of knowledge, what does it even mean to say we need more of this knowledge, or that it might move us towards multi-species justice? Unless, of course, we literally sample or survey every square meter of ground, unearthing every hidden corner. All those punctures, all those wounds, we start bringing thicker meanings to the term extractivism. So what would it mean to put the idea of more knowledge to one side, perhaps, and start thinking about multi-species justice as grounded instead in concepts like estrangement, complicity, contiguity? In the first place, estrangement would ask that we think about justice via a commitment to making or keeping things strange, pulling back a little bit, Pulling out, maybe. Multi-species justice within four stygofauna, those adamant archives of time through time and resolute holders of place in place, would be less about hauling their cool and quiet underworlds into an increasingly glaring light, and more about thinking about what other kinds of knowledges and relations might draw us to them. Our own relation to extractivism, for example and the kinds of ecologies it worlds. When we refer to stygofauna as climate refugees, this isn't a metaphor, nor is it an analogy. In 2019, it is impossible to utter either of those words, climate or refugee, in a poetic or analogical way. Instead, I invoke these words in a mode of contiguity, what Karen Barad or Donna Haraway might call a diffractive mode. Contiguity is about tracing how we are alongside, athwart, and connected to things that are not us, to issues that seem distant or unknowable, but nonetheless find their meaningfulness through patternings of relations. 
thinking about Steiger fauna in the context of their drying and destructing environments in a time of the sixth extinction and the precipitation of human climate refugees around the world can thus allow us to see more clearly the structures of power and the lineaments of possibility that hold all of these bodies and ecologies together. So Stygo fauna are not like human climate refugees from the Pacific or from the dying river country of Central Australia even. But they are gathered up in the same weathers. They are connected by the same weather makers. In this way, justice for Stygo fauna is not just an ecological question or a question of biodiversity and conservation. Justice for Stygofauna is firmly sutured to questions of human, racial, economic, gender, and anti-colonial anti justice, too. So thinking with Stygofauna and what multi-species justice might mean in the context of these creatures, then, might mean always thinking, like thinking ecologically, always thinking relationally, always thinking of how everything matters in the context of other things, and everything matters differently. So it's not then an object-oriented analysis of justice, but an analysis based on our own contiguity and complicity. It demands thinking of the systems of capitalism, colonialism, consumerism, and other lineaments of power that pull us together and cleave us apart. So here at last we circle back to the weather underground. The thing about weather is that it swirls around us, gathering us, connecting us. Even as we are not all equally affected, remember as Tim Choi tells us, atmospheres don't equalize. We can nonetheless trace patterns of relation through and as the weather. We could ask, what are the patternings of the weather that draw us into relation with stygofauna? not because they are like us, nor because we easily consider them kin, nor because we know them well, but because we are deeply complicit in their worlds, not only as miners or mining corporations, but as settlers, as researchers, as scientists, electricity users, storytellers. That is, we are all weather makers above and below the ground. Okay, that's it.